Good morning, Foothill Church. I'm Heather and a covenant partner. And I volunteer with the Impact on Wednesday nights serving the food for Feast and Fellowship. Come join us if you want to serve tons of hungry kids. Um, today's scripture is found in Luke 18, 1 to 8. Please stand for the reading of God's word. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is God's word. You may be seated. How you doing? You all right? Good. It's really good to be with you. Um, uh, grace, peace from Belfast from your brothers and sisters there. Um, you, you saw the video. I'm not going to repeat all that, but thank you. Um, thanks for being you. Thanks for giving the way you do, for loving Jesus the way you do. Um, it's amazing. Um, today's all about prayer, so I'm going to pray one more time. Um, God, we just thank you for who you are for us. Um, we don't know what tomorrow holds, um, so we ask for your help. Um, and we ask for your help right now, Lord. Um, Spirit, would you teach us? Um, would you do what I can't do, which is open hearts and impart truth into souls? We ask you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Great. Uh, hopefully you have your Bibles open to Luke chapter 18. Um, you've been going through this series of the parables of Jesus. Um, this parable is quite handy because um, unlike some of them, there's no puzzle to kind of unpack. You know, some of Jesus' parables are a little bit more mysterious, a little bit more work to do, kind of digging to uh, unpack the truth and apply that. Um, this isn't one of those kind of parables at all. It's rich, it's powerful, uh, but Luke begins by telling us what it's all about. So in verse one, Luke says, and he told them, Jesus told them this parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. No puzzle to piece together, no mystery, it's quite simple. Jesus tells this story that we always pray and not lose heart. Uh, so it's a parable about faith. It's a bar parable about persevering in prayer. How's your prayer life? And um, what, what does prayer look like in, in your life right now? Are you someone uh, who's just always praying? Um, I won't have you raise your hands, but I, I'd guess if we did a kind of group poll and I'd say, hey, raise your hands if you're someone who's just always praying. I'm sure a few hands would go up, um, but most of us uh, struggle to pray. It's a common thing, isn't it? To struggle with consistent, persistent prayer. And so this prayer, this parable uh, is incredibly pertinent. It's incredibly important for all of us because prayer is essential to the Christian life. Um, John 15, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, and Jesus talks about the importance of remaining with him. Uh, you're a vine that needs to stay, you're a, you're a branch that needs to stay connected to him, the vine. Uh, it's about being in his presence, staying connected with him. Um, it's a chapter really about prayer, isn't it? Um, Jesus puts it pretty bluntly when he's talking about this, and he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. It's pretty blunt, isn't it? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Um, so prayer, it's not like a, a bonus add-on to the Christian life. Um, prayer isn't optional uh, to a life with God. It's, it's foundational. It's essential uh, to doing anything in your life with Jesus. Uh, beware of thinking that God gives kind of like a gift of prayer to some people. Um, in Ephesians 4, Paul talks about uh, the body of Christ, which is you represented here this morning, uh, and he talks about these, these various gifts that, that God gives to the members of his, of his body. Uh, Paul talks about it in more detail in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He says there's, there's one body with many members, 
on display. It's, it's beautiful, isn't it? Like you're all here, members of one body, gathered together. Uh, and he says there's spiritual gifts that are given to each of the members of his body. Um, so every member is important. Uh, every member is, is essential. And um, it's not just about who's up here leading with a microphone. You are here not just to be a spectator, n- not just to be uh, kind of entertained or to, to consume, but to be part of and to use your giftings. And God has given you all a variety of gifts, teaching, wisdom, helping, administration, all these gifts. But what about prayer? And if you're like me, you can think of certain people, my mom's this way, someone who just seems to have this deep commitment to prayer. Do you know anyone like that? And they just, they, they just have this, this gift of, of, of prayer. We often call them prayer warriors, right? Um, And and what's dangerous is we can sometimes think, well, I don't seem to have that gift. Um, The the gift of persistent prayer, some folks seem to have that gift and they're great at it. Others like me don't. And man, when I read the Bible, I can't find anywhere that portrays prayer as a gift to some. I only see prayer as a gift to everyone. And I only see prayer as foundational, as essential to the Christian life. Romans 12, verse 12 says, be constant in prayer. Ephesians 6, 18, praying at all times. Colossians 4, 2, continue steadfastly in prayer. 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded so that you may pray. 1 Chronicles 16, 11, seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus to you. It's pretty clear, isn't it? Like uh, continual, persistent prayer isn't a gift that God gives to some of his children. It's a gift for all of us. It's a privilege for every single one of us. It's essential for all of us if we want to successfully follow after him. So the scriptures make it clear that that call, that gift of praying at all times, continually communing with God, it's actually just part and parcel of being part of his family. Continual prayer is for all of his children. And yet we struggle to pray. We find it hard, don't we? And and, and can I encourage you just to be honest about that. Be, be open with that with your brothers and sisters. Talk about that. Don't pretend like you're just always praying when you're not. Um, what are the reasons we find it difficult to pray? Have those conversations. A lot of us would maybe point to the need for more self-discipline so we don't pray enough, like for the same reason that we don't go to the gym enough. Um, we need more resolve. We need more uh, determination, more self-control. Um, Maybe we need better structures or plans or resources to help us uh, to pray. And and that might be true. Um, Most of us could use more self-discipline. Most of us uh, need more structure. My experience is structures and rhythms help me to continue to pray. Um, But maybe there are deeper reasons for why we struggle with this. And a lot of us, if we're completely honest, would say the reason we don't pray is we don't think it does much good. Uh, Like prayer, it doesn't feel productive. It doesn't feel efficient. We like productivity. We like things to be efficient, don't we? Maybe you've experienced this process where uh, sometimes you pray and things happen, which is amazing. I love when that happens. It works. But sometimes you forget to pray and the thing that you forgot to pray for happens anyway. So does that kind of undermine the whole prayer's essential premise? And then at other times we pray really hard and then nothing happens. And deep down, we begin to think, I'm not sure there's any connection between me praying and things happening. Sometimes God answers the prayers that I didn't pray, and sometimes he doesn't answer the prayers that I did. Do my prayers do anything? Maybe there's no God up there, and there's no God listening. Things are just happening the way they happen. Or maybe there is a God, but he's going to do what he's going to do, irrespective of me. And so that we often give up on prayer, We can often do what Jesus warns us against, of losing heart, growing weary, giving up on faith altogether, sometimes in a dramatic way, leaving church, or sometimes in more dangerous kind of quiet ways. We just become prayerless, or almost prayerless. We pray sometimes. Um, And listen, if that describes you this morning, I don't want you to leave here feeling beat down. I don't want you to leave here feeling discouraged. Um, I want you to take heart 
Because Jesus is aware of your struggle. Jesus isn't surprised that you struggle to pray. Um, isn't that so encouraging that, that he knows you? Uh, he's, he's not surprised with what you struggle with. He's not uh, disappointed with you in this. He just wants to help you. Which is exactly why he gives us this parable. These stories that are meant to help us to pray. Uh, they're meant to help us to believe that your prayers aren't useless. In this short parable in Luke 18. It's exactly for that purpose. Let me read it one more time because it's quite short. And Jesus told them this parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. And he said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused But afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And Jesus said, did you hear what the unrighteous judge says? Did you hear what he says? And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And this parable actually mirrors another parable that Jesus gives in chapter 11, where his disciples come to him and they, they ask him, hey, Jesus, teach us to pray. And he gives them that model prayer. You've all heard the Lord's Prayer. And, and immediately after that, he tells them a story. He gives them a parable. And the purpose of that parable is to help them because he knows they're going to struggle to pray. He knows that they're going to struggle to believe that their prayers are actually doing anything. And so he doesn't just teach them how to pray. He teaches them immediately why they should never give up praying. And that story in chapter 11, I'm sure you've heard it. It's about a man who goes and knocks on his friend's door in the middle of the night and asks him for three loaves of bread because he has guests coming and he doesn't have anything to to give them. Um, It's an incredibly bold, uh, shameless request, isn't it? Um, We live in a a, a culture now where you'll hardly go to someone's door without texting them to tell you, tell them, hey, I'm outside first, right? And, And imagine going and knocking on a friend's door in the middle of the night when everyone's asleep and waking the children up and everything. And Jesus would say, this friend will probably have some questions for you. Why are you waking everyone up in the middle of the night? And Jesus says that the, 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 the guy isn't going to get up and give, him what, give his uh, friend what he needs because he's his friend. He, he's going to give up and, and, and give him what he needs because of the impudence of his knocking. Because of the boldness. Because of the shamelessness of the seeker. He'll get the bread because he's bold, because he's shamelessly knocking. He'll get what he needs because he's the kind of guy who will go to his friend's house in the middle of the night and wake everyone up with his continual knocking. And Jesus' point is that scene should depict your prayer time with God. You're called to to, to ask and to seek and to knock boldly and shamelessly. The implication is God only gives some things in response to ongoing prayer patient, relentless, bold praying. God delights to share his power with those who are bold enough to bother him. And he makes the exact same point with this parable of the persistent widow in chapter 18. Again, he knows you're going to struggle to pray. He knows that you're going to maybe lose heart. So he gives another parable to help you and to encourage you. In this story, the person who's doing the asking is this widow who wants justice from her adversary. We don't know exactly the situation, probably financial situation. Uh, The details aren't really the point. The point is she needs help and she's seeking justice. And the person who's doing the the answering is this judge who we're told neither feared God nor respected man. So he's an unfair judge. He's he's corrupt. He's selfish. Um, And he keeps refusing this uh, to help this widow. Um... In our culture, we kind of we're maybe not surprised with like corrupt judges. I don't know. I don't know about here, but um, this is meant to be surprising to the original readers uh, because in these courts, there was meant to be almost like a triage system. So if you've ever gone to like the emergency room, the first person you generally see is a triage nurse, and she's there to kind of see what your needs are. If you have a scraped knee, you're probably not going to be seen before the guy with kind of like blood coming out of his ears, right? There's a system of, of who will seen, uh, be seen first. And so these courts of, uh, of law were actually favored the widows, and the, the, the widows would be moved to the top of the list to be helped, but not with this judge. Because he didn't fear God. He didn't fear man. He didn't care about 
uh, law. So he keeps refusing her for a while, we're told. And Jesus says, even though he neither feared God nor respected man, he eventually gives in and gives her justice. And the reason he answers her is the same as the previous story. The judge says, because she keeps bothering me, because she just won't stop asking. And the point here, again, is this scene should depict your prayer life with God. It's interesting, isn't it? Like if you're paying attention, you should maybe feel a little uneasy, a little squirmy uh, because of who's being represented in the story here. In, in Jesus' story, we obviously are the widow, right? We're the ones who are in need, who are coming to ask for help. But, but that means in Jesus' analogy, who does the unjust, selfish judge represent? God, uh, which should make you squirm a little bit. And sometimes Jesus likes to do that because Jesus' purpose is not to compare God with this unjust judge, but to contrast him. And his point is, even if this judge, this evil judge would grant the request of this widow because of her patient, relentless asking, how much more will the perfect judge of the world who knows you, who created you, who loves you, how much more will he grant the request of his children who persistently come to him? The answer is meant to be obvious, infinitely more. He's, he's an infinitely better judge who loves and cares for you infinitely more than this judge cared for the widow. He'll grant his, the request infinitely more. So perhaps the reason we don't think our prayers change anything is because we often give up too soon. Maybe God doesn't seem like he's listening because he wants us to bother him. He, he, he's wanting us to, to boldly and persistently approach the throne of grace for help in our time of need. This parable teaches us three crucial points about prayer. Uh, the rest of this, this sermon will be really simple because we tend to make prayer overcomplicated sometimes. So uh, it's gonna show us that our prayers should be desperate, should be bold, and should be persistent. Firstly, pray desperately. Um, one thing that's true about both the main characters in these parables is that they are completely and utterly desperate. They, they have no other options. They have no one else to turn to for help. The unprepared host in, in chapter 11 has nowhere else to go for food for his guests. And this poor wronged widow, she's helpless. She doesn't have anyone else to turn to for justice. She doesn't have a husband. She doesn't have family or friends who will stand up for her. In this situation, the judge is her only hope. Listen, one of the things that keeps us from praying is we simply fail to recognize how utterly and desperate we are for God's help. And this is what we're taught in the West, isn't it? Anything is possible as long as you work hard enough for it. That's the American dream, right? You can do it. Uh, given enough time, given enough energy, we can figure out the solution. And, and that spirit of optimism and innovation is great. Um, it's brought, brought about great things in the world. Uh, but that spirit of overcoming obstacles and believing you can by working hard enough for it, it can be absolutely deadly when it comes to spiritual things. Because again, Jesus says in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So the kingdom of God has this upside down approach to our way. It's this life of acknowledging that we are utterly lost and utterly helpless without Jesus. We have no other hope but Jesus. Apart from him, we can do nothing. And so prayerlessness often comes uh, from the fact that deep down, we don't always believe him when he says that. Prayerlessness believes, I just need a little bit more time. I just need a slightly longer to-do list. I need a little bit more money, a little bit more planning. That's what we need. Rarely will we say it in those kind of blunt terms. That's often what we believe in our hearts though, isn't it? That's often what our actions tell us that we believe. And I'll be honest, I can make excuses uh, for my actions by saying I'm, I'm too tired to pray. It's been a long day. Um, I, I'm too busy. We can kind of let ourselves off the hook in those ways. But it's often in our heart of hearts, we simply don't recognize our desperate need to pray. We think enough time, enough resources, and we can sort it out until something happens in your life that proves that that's not true. This is why we need suffering. We live in a society that, that works to avoid suffering at all cost, and, but we actually need suffering. That's a biblical thing. As Christians, we can rejoice and we can be thankful even in our suffering because suffering forces us to realize that Jesus was right 
when he said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And last year, our family had one of those years that forced us to believe that Jesus was right when he said that. Um, in, in June of last year, my wife Jenny went in for a, a pretty major surgery. She was meant to be in for about 10 days of recovery, and she ended up being in for about a month. Um, really difficult, uh, painful recovery. Um, that's meant single parent for a month. Uh, the evenings were me just on our, on our floor, put kids to bed and, and have nothing else to offer but some prayers. Um, during that time, uh, her mother was diagnosed with bone cancer and she died eight weeks later. Um, a few months later, uh, our oldest son, Abraham, um, went into the hospital. Is this past week that this happened, actually a year ago, he went into the hospital with a respiratory virus and uh, he just kept getting sicker and sicker and his, his blood oxygen saturation levels kept dipping. Um, and there's nothing I can do except sit there and, and pray. Um, it was dreadful, I'll be honest with you. We thought our son was dying. Um, it got to the point where they had to intubate him and, and put him on a ventilator for a few days. And it was yesterday, a year ago, that they brought him off the ventilator and uh, he's, doing, he's doing well. But it's that season, those seasons of suffering, of dark valleys that, that show you, oh, man, Jesus, you're right, that, that I, I am helpless. <laughs> I have nothing to offer. We need you. And suffering shows you that often enough time, enough planning, enough resources just aren't enough. And suffering forces you to realize that our only hope is to throw ourselves on the mercy of God in prayer. And so those people that you think are prayer warriors, I'll let you in on a little secret. They're just people who have suffered a lot. And they're, they're usually just people who have walked through enough valleys of the shadow of death that they've realized, wow, God actually is with me. He actually is providing for me. He's actually my only hope. He's the only real way forward is to constantly seek him. So don't begrudge the suffering in your life. We don't celebrate it. It's, it's hard, but don't let it get you hard. Single folks, some of you might be struggling with loneliness and you're learning that no matter how much you try to fill up your time with activities, with doing stuff, even with being with people, that, that, that void in your heart is still longing. You, 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 there, there's, there's still something missing. And let me tell you, things will never fill that up. Even a, a, a spouse will not fill that void in your heart. What you need more than anything is to realize that only one person can tru truly satisfy your desires. You desperately need Jesus. The parents in the room, some of you will be learning that no matter how many parenting books you read, uh, that tell you just do A, B, and C and your kids will work out fine. You're learning that's simply not true. I'm learning that uh, acutely right now. You're learning that having a philosophy of if I can just become an expert at Christian parenting, then I'll be able to guarantee my kids will turn out right. That's not true. That's not the message of the Bible. Uh, God is a perfect parent and his children fall, his, ch his children uh, rebel. So unless you think you can outparent God, uh, you'll need to learn that our only hope in raising children is to throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus. Looking to him for his mercy and his grace in our kid's life, for him to do what we cannot do. He's our only hope. And, and, and listen, I'm not saying principles are bad. Uh, we should learn the principles, we should apply the principles, but most of all, we should cast ourselves on the mercy of God in prayer. Pastor J.D. Greer says, Jesus didn't save us by teaching us principles. He saved us uh, by offering us resurrection power. Jesus did not come down to impart a guidebook for us to live by, but a spirit to live in and through us. It'd be a tragedy to master the principles and then forget the relationship that gives them life. So friends, our only hope, our only hope for ourselves and for our families and for this church right here lies in God's grace. The, the success of this church does not lie on your efforts. It does not lie on your abilities. It doesn't not, not lie on your, on your techniques or anything like that. It lies squarely on the power of God. It lies squarely on his grace. Do you believe that? Um, not saying those other things aren't important, that those other things aren't gifts from him at times, but do you believe that your only hope is found in the power of Jesus? If you do believe that, you'll be someone who prays and continues to pray. Do your prayers have that tone of desperation? That tone that only comes from knowing that what you most want or need, you cannot do. Only he can provide. 
How often do you consider your need of God, your helplessness? And the more you consider that, the more desperate you'll become and the more you'll pray. Um, in his book, Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire, Jim Cimbalo, pastors Brooklyn Tabernacle in New York City, he, he said they decided early on in their church plant that they decided to gauge the health of their church, not necessarily on the attendance of their Sunday services, but on the attendance of their prayer meetings. Because they, are, they wanted to be desperate for God's power, desperate for God's grace. That's something to consider. That's the first point. Pray desperately but not only is the, the widow desperate for help, she's also bold. She's seeking justice from a judge she didn't know, and, and he was actually known for not giving justice, and, but that doesn't get in her way. She continues to come. She continues to ask boldly. And remember, Jesus isn't comparing God with this unjust judge. He's contrasting him. He's not saying God is this unreluctant or unjust uh, God, unreluctant to help. No, he's saying he's, he's far better if this unfair judge helped this widow, how much more will our heavenly father help us? Don't miss the contrast here. Greer says this woman comes to the judge as a marginalized stranger. We come to God as his beloved children. She had nothing to plead in court. We have the blood of Christ. She spoke to the judge who cared very little for, for justice and even less for her. We speak, we speak to the one who cares so much for us that he got out of the judge's chair and hung on a cross to satisfy the demands of justice on our behalf in order that he might share with us the riches of his kingdom. What contrast. What a better judge. And do you see that when we begin to understand who we are and who we are asking, we have no option but to pray boldly. Because the closer the relationship, the bolder the asking. It's like my kids coming to me in the middle of the night to ask for a drink of water. And if you grew up in the 80s or 90s, you remember a show called Unsolved Mysteries? It's kind of a scary, like, I remember this one episode where the, you know, they woke up and there's a guy, stranger, sitting out of the foot, of the foot of their bed. It's like, oh, now every time I wake up in the middle of the night, one of these. That's not what this is. It's, it's kids um, that don't think twice. They, they, they don't think twice about whether they should be asking. Kids have no hesitation in coming to ask. They have a boldness because of their relationship. They, they have no question whether they should come in and put their face an inch from mine and say, Dad, I need a glass of water. <laughs> it's just boldness. Some, such undaunted confidence in their approach. And this is how God asks us to approach him, boldly like children asking for water in the middle of the night because they want a glass of water, because they need a glass of water, and they have no question of whether they'll get one or not. Many of our failures in prayer are not because we're asking for too much, but because we imagine the love of our Heavenly Father is too small. Do you realize how wealthy and how generous your Heavenly Father is? John 15, Jesus says God's purpose in our, in, in our prayers is to glorify himself. So the more we ask of him, the more he is glorified. And there's a story about Alexander the Great who conquered for himself an empire two-thirds the size of the United States. And towards the end of his pretty short life, one of his generals came to him and said, Alexander, I've served you faithfully all of these years. I've never asked you for anything. Now I have one request. What is it, replied the young emperor, the general answered, I would like you to pay for my daughter's wedding. Well, you've served me faithfully all these years, said Alexander. I will happily pay for this wedding. Go and speak to my treasurer about it. And a few days later, the treasurer came to talk to Alexander, and he said, you need to punish that general. He, he's, he's trying to take advantage of you. He's, he's requesting funds for the greatest wedding the empire has ever seen. He's invited everyone. He's taking advantage of your generosity. You must punish him. And the story goes, Alexander thought about it for a minute and then he answered, no, I want to give him exactly what he's asking for. And the treasurer, amazed, asked Alexander why. Be because, replied Alexander, my general is paying me two compliments. First, he thinks I am wealthy enough to afford all of this. Secondly, he thinks that I am I'm actually sufficiently generous that I will do it. He's acting as though I am wealthy and generous. So I will give him the request because in making this request, my, my general shows me tremendous honor. So this general's request actually glorified Alexander. He was, he was actually honoring to Alexander. 
In contrast, Alexander with God. Alexander the Great may have ruled a great empire for a few years on earth, but God created the earth and rules over it for eternity. His wealth is infinitely more than Alexander's. He is infinitely more generous, infinitely more, and he proves that by giving his only son so that his enemies could be restored to him and enjoy his fellowship forever. So ask yourselves that question. What would your request of God be like if you really believe that God is infinitely wealthy and infinitely generous? They'd be incredibly bold. And lastly, we're to pray persistently. That's why Jesus tells this parable that we ought always to pray and not lose heart. Um, So the reason the the judge grants the requests of the widow is because of her continual coming. Um, And you see this kind of prayer in the early church. Remember in Acts chapter 11, Peter's imprisoned and the church gathers to pray all night for his release. Um, And they they didn't pray once. They didn't pray, they didn't like have an hour's prayer meeting. They prayed and prayed and prayed all night until he was released. In, In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, remember Paul prayed for that thorn in the flesh, that, that, that finally God sent an angel to tell him that, that God has a purpose in not taking it away and he should stop praying for it. So the point, it's not that, hey, if we just ask long enough, you can manipulate God into giving you exactly what you want. Because sometimes, like with Paul, he says no, because he has a better plan. Jesus knew that. That was Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Asking his father, if there's any other way, father, would you let this cup pass from me? And the answer was, I have something better. I'm doing something better here. Trust me. And Jesus does trust his father, and he prays, not my will, but yours. When Lazarus was sick, and his sisters go to to Jesus, and they say, come immediately and and, and help. And he doesn't. He, He waits, and he lets Lazarus die, for he had a greater plan But the point is, great great saints pray so persistently that they have to be told to stop. And many of us miss out on God's answers because we stop far too soon. It's another way of saying our prayers to God should be like that continual persistent child. At some point, there's a a stage in kids' lives where no is not really an answer. It's It's an invitation to further negotiation. And if you're a parent in that situation, you think, you are annoying, you're, you're being naughty. When are you gonna learn? But Jesus is saying, that's how I want you to pray. Praying persistently, steadfastly until you have to be told to stop because God answers persistent prayer. And as some people, this might be the trickier point to understand and to, to kind of wrestle with. You might be thinking, is that kind of cruel of God? Is it unfair? Like if, if he wants to give us his blessings, why doesn't he just give it to us when we first ask? My most honest quest answer is I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, Isaiah 55 says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. Trust me. That's the most straightforward answer. But there's a couple things we can understand from these stories. Firstly, that, that God is glorified through persistence. And that's true because in persisting in our request, We're showing that God is the only place we have to go. And that's glorifying to him. That the widow had no other options. She didn't have another judge to go to. She didn't have anyone else to help. She had one hope, one person who could help. And so she persisted. And when when we pray persistently, we're showing that we have that same conviction about God. You're, You're the only help we have. That there's no one else we can turn to. I know you're good. I know you love me. I know you can help. I'm confident in that. I'm going to stand right here and knock because I have that hope. And praying once or twice doesn't demonstrate that. Praying persistently does and it glorifies God and that's why God is delighted to answer persistent prayer. And secondly, persistent prayer, it's also the way God gives us faith. It's the way he increases our faith, right? Think of every single t- time my kids came and asked me for something and I gave it to them immediately. What would they be like? My hunch is our relationship would remain pretty surface level, right? I'd be a vending machine. Put in the right request and you're gonna get what you need. But when I hold things back, sometimes because I know more than them, or I know that's not a good thing for them, or there's something better, or to teach them to have patience, it's not easy for them, but our relationship grows deeper because they have to trust me. 
And if I, as an imperfect heavenly father, do that, how much more perfectly and justly will our heavenly father do that? He wants you to not lose heart. He wants you to have faith in him. And so sometimes he asks you to persist in your asking because there's something we learn in the struggle. Isn't there? There's, there's something, that there's a strengthening of our faith in the waiting. That's what Peter says, right? Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, though it perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's something he's doing in the waiting. And how does Jesus end the parable? He says, nevertheless, the Son of Man comes as Jesus. When Jesus comes again, will he find faith on earth? So when Christ comes again, what is he looking to find? His people with faith. And so if you've been praying and praying and you don't yet have an answer, keep praying. If you've been praying and praying and you didn't get an answer and so you stopped praying, start praying again. Continue to knock, don't give up. G.K. Chesterton once wrote, the trouble with Christianity and society was not that it had been found tried and found, that it had been tried and found lacking, but that it had been found difficult and left untried. I wonder if the same is for our prayers. It's not that we have prayed desperately and boldly and persistently and found it lacking, but that we've lacked those things in our prayers and just given up. Brother or sister, do you know of your desperate need for Jesus? Do you believe him when he says, apart from me, you can do nothing? And so continue to stay with me, seek me, stay connected with me, remain with me. Are you desperate in your prayers? Do you realize who he is? Do do you realize how good and loving and wealthy and generous he is? And do you realize who you are in relation to him? You are a beloved child. He's purchased you with his blood. You are a dweller in his house. And therefore, how boldly you should be asking, how shamelessly you should be coming to him. Are you praying big, bold prayers? And are you praying persistently? Are you coming to him again and again and again? Have you learned to pray continually because there's nowhere else to turn for help? Do you trust him? Have you lost heart Have you grown weary? Will you trust him enough to continue to ask? Be a church that prays. Let let that be one of your defining features. Um, There's a lot going on here, isn't there? There's a lot to do, a lot of ministry to do, a lot of planning. Um, Make it your first priority to be people who pray. Desperately and boldly and persistently, what would happen? Colossians 4, 2, Paul says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So there's that sense of anticipation that should be in your prayers. Praying and praying and then watching and watching. See what God does. So let's be people who pray desperate, bold, persistent prayers and see what our Heavenly Father does. Let's pray. And Father, we thank you for who you are. And Lord, we, we just want to confess again that the success of your church is, lies squarely on your power, on your grace, on what you are empowering your people to do. We thank you that you are good. We thank you that your steadfast love truly endures forever. We thank you that you are holding the universe together with the power of your word. We thank you that you are infinitely wealthy, infinitely generous. And yet we pray that ancient prayer, I believe, but help my own belief. Would you help us? Would you give us more faith, Lord? Would you increase our faith? And that's a little scary to pray because sometimes it means walking through some valleys. We thank you that you are the good shepherd who is with us 
who provides for us, who follows after us with your goodness and your mercy. God, I pray for the, 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 the weary hearts in this room. And Jesus, help us to believe you when you said, come to me when you're weary. Come to me when you're heavy laden and I'll give you rest. The kind of rest that you'll not be able to find anywhere else. Lord, may we believe that. What will you do? Lord, what will you do from a church that is desperately, boldly, and persistently praying? Be glorified, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.